Hi, everyone. Let's talk about salt. A pinch of salt can turn a meal from a bland ordeal to a scrumptious experience. A 20 kilogram bag of salt can turn a pool from a smelly chlorinated pond to a beautiful relaxing oasis. A few thousands of kilograms of salt can turn solar power from an intermittent technology to a continuous on-demand source of power. Granted, there are a few intermediate steps before we get there, and of course my research contributions. But before we dive deeper into everything that is 24-hour solar power, let's, t let's examine how we typically generate our grid-scale power. So what we've been doing for years is using thermal power plants to generate our everyday electricity. We have fuel and air as the inputs to our system. These two are burned together in order to generate heat, and that heat is used to produce steam. The steam is then fed to a turbine, the turbine powers a generator, ultimately giving us the electricity we need. And the good thing about this kind of system is that whenever we need power, we burn fuel. It's on demand, there's no need for additional storage. And we're also very good at doing this. But as we know by now, this is definitely not a sustainable way of doing things. There are two big issues here, the first being the non-renewable fuel inputs, which are typically coal, oil, and gas. And then the second issue being the greenhouse gas emissions and other pollutants that are released by the combustion of these non-renewable fuel inputs. But what if I told you that there was a way to, uh, as we transition towards renewable, we didn't have to throw to waste all of our knowledge on the steam cycle and heat. What if there was a way to combine this cycle with renewables? Well, that's exactly what we call a solar thermal power plant, or you may have heard of it as concentrated solar power plants, or CSP. So now our problematic fuel inputs have been replaced by the sun, mirrors, and a heat transfer fluid, all the while still utilizing our highly developed steam cycle. So there are a few different kinds of CSP plants, but the operating principles remain generally the same. So sunlight is reflected by mirrors called heliostats onto a central receiver. And in that central receiver, we have a flowing heat transfer fluid. And that fluid absorbs the concentrated solar radiation as heat, and then that heat is used as the input to our steam cycle. Additionally, these kinds of systems are especially well suited to being paired with what we call thermal energy storage, which are shown by the two big tanks here. So what this means is that as the sun is shining, extra heat can be stored in the tank, and when the sun is no longer shining, well then we could use that heat to produce our electricity. So this means that we now have the ability to provide 24 hours of solar power with only eight hours of sunlight. But we can see how our ability to provide this 24 hours of solar power is highly dependent upon the storage medium used. And in many cases, the storage medium is molten salt. So this brings us to the question, well, what is molten salt? So we're all used to seeing salt in this solid, granulated form. We put some on our food, we put some on our, our winter roads, we put some in our pools, the list goes on. However, when salt is heated above 220 degrees Celsius, it becomes molten or in other words, liquid. And in this liquid state, salt is able to absorb a lot of heat and it does so at ambient pressure. And this is very beneficial for long-term storage because now we aren't dealing with highly pressurized, dangerous systems and we don't require large amounts of lithium as we would if we were using batteries for storage. But CSP systems aren't perfect systems. There's a lot of cost and complexity associated with pumping these large amounts of salt through these large systems and these tall towers, and also continuously tracking their temperature to make sure they remain liquid. So this means that we're now taking our inexpensive, abundant resource, the salt, and we're turning it into a costly technology. So this is why the newest iteration of these CSP plants, one of the prototypes being called the CS Pond for con concentrated solar power on demand, actually combines the receiver and the two storage tanks together into one single tank. And this is what it looks like. So now what's happening is that the concentrated sunlight is being focused onto a central receiver, and that central, uh, that central reflector is positioned directly above an open tank of molten salt. So the molten salt is directly absorbing the solar radiation and it's able to store it for many hours. Well, this is finally where my research comes in because I'm interested with what is going on within that tank of molten salt.
So if we take a look at a schematic of what the inside of the tank looks like. I was saying before, so we have the molten salt directly absorbing the concentrated solar radiation. So this means that we now have a hot layer of salt at the top of our tank. And this hot salt is leaving the top of the tank and going to our steam cycle. And once it comes down, this cooled down salt is now entering the bottom of the tank. And these two sections are separated by a divider plate. The geometry of the divider plate is such that it allows for flow of salt around the edges as it moves during the time of day. So as the sun is shining, this plate moves down in order, to, uh, in order to enable more energy storage. And when the sun is no longer shining, well, then the plate moves back up as more salt is being fed to our steam cycle. And the plate moves in this way because we want the hot salt temperature to remain as uniform as possible because this is going to minimize thermal, uh, thermal stresses later on in our system. So in order to achieve this uniform temperature of our hot salt, it was initially believed that we would need an additional mixing plate in this system. So in that CS pond that I concept that I was talking about, this is the actual mixing plate that they had in there. And this is no small piece of equipment. It's over a meter in diameter. But what was found after testing is that the temperature uniformity could actually be achieved without even a single stroke of this mixing plate. The temperature uniformity was achieved only with a naturally occurring phenomenon. So this is great. We have now, we're able to provide continuous solar power. We know that we can remove an additional piece of equipment. But before I keep going down this CSP story, let me first recap some of the building blocks that we've seen. So we have our abundant, affordable salt. We know that we're able to build full-scale power plants utilizing this salt and even our previous knowledge of the steam cycle. And even going further into the new iterations of these plants, we know that we're able to remove mechanical equipment because of the advantageous behavior of the salt. Well, what we're starting to see here and understand is that actually all of this is conditional on us gaining a better understanding of the heat transfer that's governing the molten salt behavior. And that is exactly what I am doing in my research. But before I start throwing around all these heat transfer terms, let me first explain the three general modes of heat transfer. So the first mode is called conduction, and this is the heat transfer mechanism through which heat is conducted or is transported through a medium. So for example, if we take um, the example of heating up water on a cooktop, this would be the process by which the heat is transferred from your cooktop to the inner surface of your cooking pot. The second mode of heat transfer is convection. So this happens between a solid surface and a flowing fluid. And there are two kinds of convection. There's forced convection and there's natural convection. So if we take this example of heating up the water once again, forced convection is when the fluid is forced to move. So if it were, for example, if we were to put a spoon and start mixing in our water, well then forced convection is the mechanism by which the heat is transferred from our cooking pot to our water. And then the second is natural convection. So this is when the flow of the fluid is only due to a natural force. So it's only due to a temperature gradient. So the example of heating our water, well, our water starts to move as it's, he it's being heated because there's a large temperature difference between the hot bottom of our cooking pot and the colder top. And then finally, the last mode of heat transfer is radiation. And this is the process by which energy is emitted in the form of photons for all media. But if we're talking about heat transfer, well, then we're concerned with thermal radiation. So this is when energy is emitted by all media due to their temperature. So we have thermal radiation going on everywhere around here. But if we, if we think about our, our, our warming up of our water, well, then every point inside the water is emitting, absorbing, and scattering thermal radiation. So in my research, I'm concerned with two of these modes. I'm concerned with natural convection, and I'm concerned with thermal radiation. So remember when I was saying that there was uh, this great natural phenomenon that allowed us to achieve temperature uniformity and we could remove a mixing plate? Well, that was none other, none other than natural convection. And because the salts operate at such high temperatures, well, radiative heat transfer, or that thermal radiation, also becomes a dominating mode of heat transfer. And this is where the problem lies, because we don't fully understand convection radiation interactions within the molten salt. And our current heat transfer models aren't able to accurately describe these, these complex interactions. So this means that we're not able to accurately predict the behavior of the salt, and we aren't taking full advantage of these uh, beneficial situations, such as the passive mixing. Therefore, my research goal is to characterize these convection radiation interactions by utilizing a non-invasive visualization technique. 
And my research can be broadly separated into two big categories. So the first, and what I've done so far, is that I have to prove the viability of the experimental technique that I'm trying to to perform on the salts, because oftentimes in molten salt experimentation, what people do is they use a surrogate fluid. But that doesn't work because my entire objective is to apply an experimental technique directly on the molten salts in order to get the most accurate results possible. And then once I've proven the viability of my experimental technique, well then I can start playing with my different heat transfer conditions in order to truly isolate natural convection and see how thermal radiation will affect this. So the technique that I'm using in part one of my research, what I've done, is particle image velocimetry, or PIV for short. And you might be wondering why am I using a fluid flow, um, a fluid flow experiment to solve a heat transfer problem? Well, if you remember when I was explaining natural convection, which is a mode of heat transfer, it's the one driving the flow. So here the flow and our heat transfer are highly coupled. And the PIV technique is not new by any means, but it's never been applied directly to molten salt before. Some people have cited the high temperature of the salts, others have talked about the corrosive environment. Well, taking all of this into account, what I was able to do in the lab was actually build this entire setup, find materials that could work with the molten salts in order to perform and to prove the viability of PIV being done on molten salts for the very first time at a bulk temperature of roughly 400 degrees Celsius. And let me show you what that looks like in my molten salt test section. So what you see here on the left is my raw video. So these are um, little light scattering particles that the salt has been seeded with in order to perform the PIV analysis. And once again, these particles are moving only due to the temperature difference between the hot bottom of my crucible and the colder exposed surface. And then after having applied a processing software where I, I'll get my final PIV video where what you see is the velocity vectors of every point in the salt in real time. And this is already a great contribution to molten salt experimentation because as I said before, this had never been done on, PIV had never been done on molten salt before. And although I'm very happy with these quantitative results, well now I'm interested into the quantitative aspect of everything. So that brings me to my heat transfer analysis and playing with my different heat transfer configurations. So this is the work that's ongoing in the lab right now where I'm playing around with different parameters in my molten salt test section. So I'm playing around with the geometry of my crucible, with the insulation, my heating setup. And this is all once again in order to truly be able to see how thermal radiation and natural convection will affect each other. So looking at one frame of this PIV and everything that's going on in the lab, it's maybe not clear how all of this ties back to a system containing thousands of kilograms of salt. Well, from my PIV experiment, I'm able to obtain a lot of fundamental data on the molten salt. I can gain information on the velocity fields, I can gain information on the formation of convection cells, on the onset of turbulence, and even on the intensity of that turbulence. And this is all data that goes a long way in helping our understanding towards natural convection and how it behaves with thermal radiation. And this is essentially exactly the passive mixing that's going on in our large scale system. So this means that we're now, with this experimental data, better able to model and to predict our full-scale systems. We can improve their performance, we can improve their longevity as well, and this is leading us towards cost-effective 24-hour solar power. And even going beyond solar, and if we think about the new generation of nuclear reactors, well, these new reactors are meant to be smaller, they're meant to be modular, and most of all, they're meant to be safer. And a key component of this increased safety is actually natural convection of the reactor coolant. Because the goal is to implement these passive safety systems, whereas in the event of a loss of power, so no pumps, no mechanical equipment can work, we still want our reactor coolant to be circulating and removing the heat from our core. From our core. And as you'll have guessed it, well, in many cases, molten salt is the primary coolant in a lot of these new designs. So whether we're talking about concentrated solar or the new generation of nuclear reactors, we can see how important it is to obtain fundamental experimental data on molten salts. It allows us to test and validate our systems. It allows us to cut down on costs by eliminating extra mechanical equipment. And it allows us to build trust around these innovative technologies. So as we strive to deliver 24-7 renewable power to everyone around the world, we can remember that we don't need to throw away all of our past knowledge of thermal power plants and older technologies, but we do have to keep bringing forward diverse energy solutions to meet our growing global demand. And to me, better understanding molten salt behavior seems like a pretty good place to start. Thank you. <laughs>